In Sweden, you can go to jail for a meme, because that's how civilized and advanced Sweden is. The US state of Delaware might also become civilized and advanced by allowing children to choose their own sex and race, without even having to inform their parents. Now isn't progress great? <sighs> Speaking of progress, South Africa is slowly progressing the way the Soviet Union was progressing in early 1930s. Famine, poverty, and some good old ethnic cleansing. In other progressive news, Germany and the European Commission insist to prove to us all how much of a la-la land these places are. Germany just gave any mayor with 500 votes the authority to ban cars, and the European Commission hasn't checked the calendar yet and legitimately thinks it can regulate cryptocurrencies. <laughs> These are our stories on periodic insanity. Hello everyone and welcome to the 19th episode of Periodic Insanity. Alrighty, lots of insanity in the queue for this episode, I'm not even sure we'll be able to fit all of it into one episode, might have to pull at two episodes in a row again, which is not something I enjoy because editing these things is a genuine pain. But hey, things I do for fun, I guess, since none of these episodes in this series end up being monetized anyway, and I can't ask for a review because they don't get minimum 1,000 views. All right, winding aside, let's dive in. Uh, first piece coming from Fria Tider in Sweden, posted jokes about Islam on Facebook, now she's in jail. You can see this uh, is a biased right-wing publication since they use the, the extremist and sexist terms she, well, Horn in Swedish, rather than the politically correct term hen. <laughs> All right, let's read. Quote: After reading about the abuse perpetrated by the Islamic State, a 32-year-old woman in Gothenburg posted a joking picture about Muslims on Facebook. Now she is charged with Hetzmotsfoltgruppe after being subjected to a DNA probe and to degrading police interrogations. Now. Let uh, Hetzmot uh, Folk Group doesn't really have an equivalent in English. Literally, it means uh, being hot against a group of folks. But in the context of the Swedish law, it basically means the ethnic Swede uh, uh, said something that the far left disapproves of. So, uh, let's carry on. Quote, How do you view a multicultural society was one thing the interrogator wanted to know, among other things. The post was posted in a closed Facebook group in the spring of 2017. The reporter, and by that the article means the snitch, the rat, the dilettante scum, uh, the, so the reporter, who only identified himself as Johan Eriksson, that would be John Smith, <laughs> claimed in the police report that the 32-year-old woman expressed herself in a threatening and or depressing manner about the people group. He also attached information about the woman's age, place of residence, and her mother's identity. The police began a preliminary investigation, and the woman was called in in late January at the police station in Ernst Frontstel Plots in Jotebor for interrogation. There, she was forced to submit DNA probes to be then registered or catalogued in the investigative register. During the hearing, the woman apologized for the post in vain. She appealed for mercy and told the police that she had been ill at the moment and that she was targeting the Islamic State, not ordinary Muslims. I read a lot and watched a lot of documentaries about ISIS and how they treated people. I did not mean it badly, and then I had a fever then, she said. Then the interrogator asked uh, to know if she had, uh, if she looked at the multi how she looked at the multicultural society and if she had something against Muslims. No, I don't, uh, but I am against the Islamic State. Uh, my best friend is Muslim, so I don't mind necessarily Muslims, said the woman. Chamber prosecutor Sarah Turskog at Jotteborg's prosecutor's office, however, chose to appear in the case and prosecute the woman for Hetzmot Folk Group, a crime that can carry up to two years in jail. 
According to the prosecution, the 32-year-old woman has pronounced disenchantment with Muslims because of their creed. Close quote. Now, when I tell you that if you want to see how the DDR, or indeed the communist Romania, used to look like, just pay a visit to Sweden. It's slightly wealthier than the DDR, but the milieu is exactly the same. When I say these things, I'm not engaging in hyperbole that much, nor am I trying to be sensationalistic to get more clicks and views. I'm merely describing how Sweden actually is, rather than what the cathedral media tells you it is. Censorship, a network of apparatchiks and dilettantes who will, for sure, rat you out to the Stasi for your dissent, arbitrary laws enforced, of course, arbitrarily, and to make the DDR experience complete, the architecture is also complete and utter shit. Just like in the communist era. Although, to be fair, this is in Jotebor. Jotebor actually looks nicer than most of the country. So choose Stockholm, Westeros, or indeed Malmö for the full commie experience. Also, to make things even better, uh, the reason you don't know about these things is because Sweden, just like any respectable communist country, has an entire ministry of propaganda tasked explicitly to spread positive propaganda about Sweden outside its borders. And when someone objects to that, then that someone might be a racist. Although lately they have diversified the smears a little bit. Now they uh, sometimes call you a Russian bot or when they don't call you a racist. I explained a lot of this one year ago in the video titled Swedish Media, it's Russia's fault that Sweden's image abroad has deteriorated. A video which if you haven't, uh, if you're one of the new subscribers, you should indeed go ahead and watch. So yeah. This is what normal people are up against in Sweden. A full-blown police state that will jail you for memes. <sighs> helicopters are just too kind for these people. Now, speaking of a need for helicopters, Delaware might let, might let students choose their race and gender without parental consent via Fox News. And it's as bad as the headline suggests, and I'll read it in its entirety because I had to read this four times myself and double check and then triple check and quadruple check to make sure this isn't satire. And no, it's not satire. Quote, a proposal that would let students in Delaware as young as five choose their own race and gender identity without approval from their parents has sparked a better battle in the first state. On one side are parents who say they want a more welcoming climate for their transgender or non-binary children. On the other side are parents who say the proposal infringes on their basic parental rights. Under Regulation 225, schools would be required to provide access to facilities and activities that are consistent with the student's gender identity, regardless of the child's sex at birth. That includes bathrooms, locker rooms, team sports and adhering to the child's preferred name. Under the proposal, students could also choose their own race. What has rankled some parents is that the new regulation does not require schools to inform parents of the child's decision. Instead, the policy advises administrators to assess the child's well-being before disclosing the information to the child's parents. While a growing number of states are imposing rules to protect transgender students, Delaware's proposed rules go further, letting the child decide even if the parent disagrees with the decision. The regulation isn't about keeping a secret, it's about what's in the best interest of the child, said Mark Purpura, president of Equality Delaware. The reality is that there are children living in fear who do not, co who do not feel comfortable coming out to their parents as gay or transgender. But some say this is yet another example of government overreach. They say parents should be involved in making such a critical decision involving their children. I would be livid if the school allowed my daughter to make such a significant decision without me, said Terry Hodges, president of the Delaware PTA and committee member. Hodges said does not oppose the regulation but feels that alienating parents is not the right way to carry it out. I want to protect children, she said, but we can't pick and choose when to engage parents. The state's proposal drew more than 11,000 public comments in the, in the form of letters, emails and online submissions, the majority opposing the new rule. 
If approved, the regulation would protect 19 characteristics, protections that expert David Cohen, professor of law at Drexel University, said are not represented in the current federal anti-discrimination policy. Title IX does not explicitly cover gender, said Cohen. All it talks is about is sex discrimination, and not every court administrator or administration interprets gender identity as sex. Delaware's governor, John Carney, felt strongly that more could be done to protect students from bullying and discrimination, and in 2017 urged the DDOA to enact a policy. But last month, at the committee's final public meeting, a crowd of more than 250 people packed the auditorium of the Delaware Technical Community College to express their opposition. Delaware State Representative Rich Collins, Republican from Millsboro, said the proposed regulation is onerous, excessive, and confusing. He said the current anti-discrimination policy is concise and efficient, and replacing it with a multi-page regulation is a distraction. This is taking our eye off the ball, Collins said. We have one school that has a 3% math proficiency, and there are issues educating our kids across the state. But Andrea Rushbaum, a parent of a transgender child, said parents can't expect a child to learn if they don't feel safe. We have to take these worries off their plates, Rushbaum said. Similar to how hungry children can't perform, a child who feels unheard and misunderstood can't focus on reading or math scores. Rushbaum believes that a state regulation would put every child on an even playing field. Uh, right now, gender and race identification are, held, are handled on a school-by-school -school basis, Rushbound said. One school will help a child grow to have dignity, and the other less educated school in the same district can squash a child's self-worth. If approved, Delaware would be among the 18 states and the District of Columbia who have implemented anti-harassment regulation based on gender identification and sexual orientation. Delaware is one of the first states to draft a proposal to explicitly acknowledge gender identification in schools as a protected characteristic and violators, it's unclear if it would uh, target teachers or administrators, could be prosecuted. After a public hearing period, the Department of Education will approve or deny the regulation. Now, the good news is that this is unlikely to be approved by the Department of Education. I mean, Betsy DeVos is not brutally insane, unlike the governor of Delaware, who apparently is. The bad news is that this is being discussed to begin with, instead of being lofted off the stage and the proponents locked up in the loony bin. The even worse news is that the figures of authority appears to be, appear to be willing to push it against such a huge opposition, which goes to show just how insane the left truly is and why you should uh, all start practicing more subversion and become more cynical when dealing with these people. They're not acting in good faith. The left quite literally believes normal people don't have the right to exist and is willing to fight to suppress normal people's right to exist. And normal people should respond in kind. Like the Texas governor did by enacting a uh, specific legislation expressly banning any such policy ideas to begin with within the public sector. Again, the private sector can do whatever it wants, but the public sector and especially the portion that deals with children no. In fact, hell no. With schools uh, standing at 3% in math proficiency, there is no reasonable argument whatsoever that the mental well-being of people who are obviously not well in the head is the immediate problem. Also, let's not forget this is basically cutting the parents from the equation. You as parents no longer get to decide. It will be some bureaucrat who decides whether, whether you are allowed to know that your child suffers from a mental disorder that makes him believe he is the opposite sex or of a different race. Also, uh, why is anyone taking cues from Drexel University? That place should be forcibly converted into a mental asylum while all the students and faculty are inside and nobody should be allowed to leave until they prove beyond reasonable doubt that they're not insane. And this is being generous and assuming that uh, about 1-3% to of the people inside Drexel University are indeed non-insane. I'm not sure this is the case, but it could be. Title IX does not explicitly cover gender. All it talks about is sex discrimination and not every court administrator or administration interprets gender identity as sex, says Professor Nobody from Drexel University. Well, yeah, dipshit! 
because gender is a grammatical category and nothing more. The leftist idea of gender is a fiction, just like Cthulhu is a fiction. And no, nobody should make laws based on what Cthulhu believes, because Cthulhu is not real. Neither is gender the way leftists think about it. Ultimately, this reinforces the need for normal people to start slowly but relentlessly and consistently work towards kicking these loons to the curb. They are not the majority. They never have been. But because normal people have done nothing to stop it, they now pollute a significant chunk of the institutions. And until they will be stomped and stopped, but stomped in particular, this madness will never stop. And by stomped, I don't necessarily mean it in a physical way, not for now anyway, but the political way. Subvert the hell out of them. All elected positions should be filled by normal people, voted in by normal people. Yes, that means you have to move your ass and vote and also campaign and conduct active measures. It's hard, I know, but there is no other civilized way. And I do emphasize civilized, because the socialist not ousted in a civilized way will necessarily have to be ousted in a far less than civilized way sometime down the road. This will not end if normal people don't act. Christ Almighty, Tide Pod eating 3% math proficient children to choose their race and sex. Yeah, this will surely go down well. Bloody hell. All right, let's go further. Uh, coming via News24. National Assembly adopts motion on land expropriation without compensation. This is about South Africa. The National Assembly on Tuesday set in motion a process to amend the Constitution so as to allow for the expropriation of land without compensation. The motion brought by the EFF leader Julius Malema was adopted with a vote of 241 in support and 83 against. The only parties who did not support the motion were the DA, the Freedom Front Plus, COPE and the ACDP. The matter will now be referred to the Constitutional Review Committee, which must report back to the Parliament by August 30. The FF's motion originally called for the establishment of an ad hoc committee, which had to report back to the National Assembly by the end of May, by the, but the ANC suggested an amendment which was supported by the EFF. There will be a public participation process in the Constitutional Review Committee's work. Opening the debate on this motion, Malema said, quote, The time for reconciliation is over, now is the time for justice. He said they did not seek revenge on white people, but a restoration of black people's dignity, which was deeply rooted in the land. Uh, Gujile Inquinti, who was a member of rural affairs and land reform until Monday evening, now a minister of water affairs, said, quote, the ANC unequivocally supports the principle of land expropriation without compensation. There is no doubt about it. Land shall be expropriated without compensation, close quote. All right, so I emphasize the Minister for Water Affairs portion, because water is a far more pressing matter in South Africa right now rather than land. On July the 9th, 2018, the South African Republic will run out of clean water. Israel offered to help, but it seems that this Gugile Quinti, whatever, fuck his name, this guy is just like any other leftist racist. So this, of course, includes anti-Semitism and aversion towards Israel. It's funny because even Hamas accept Israel's help on this matter because even the Islamists must acknowledge that there really isn't anyone better than Israel when it comes to making more clean water in harsh climate. Essentially, everyone acknowledges this except the communist racists that run the South African Republic. So, institutionalized racism against white people, aversion to Jews even when their own people are in jeopardy, and aversion to capitalism. This, my fellow deplorables, is a recipe of a, for a catastrophe of Venezuelan proportions and beyond. I mean, at least Venezuela still has clean water. Zimbabwe also had clean water. South Africa is, well, going south. And this will not end well. 
So while they're on borrowed time on whether they will even have water to drink by the end of this year, the communist governance in South Africa is busy nationalizing all the land. Fucking genius! This is all straight out of the old Soviet Union. I mean, seriously, look up Lysenkoism, named after uh, Trofim Lysenko. Seriously, look that up. What South Africa wants to do is basically 21st century Lysenkoism, only this time with people as well as plants. 20th century Lysenkoism rejected evolutionary natural selection in plants. 21st century Lysenkoism rejects both evolutionary natural selection in plants and in people. This will end in famine. This is not an exaggeration, nor is it a figure of speech. Millions of people will literally starve to death, not to mention the millions more who will become famine refugees, likely in neighboring Namibia, which is the only country in that area of the continent that has not yet been affected by the virus of communism. And make no mistake, this is largely a racist motivated assault, just like Holodomor was largely a xenophobic motivated assault. The ANC, to their credit, are quite open about it. Uh, so, so is the EFF. I mean, the leader of the EFF, Julius Malema, explained almost two years ago that he is not, quote, calling for the slaughter of white people, at least for now. At least for now. Now isn't that quite kind of him? And with these people, you don't debate, because there is nothing to debate. I saw people trying to reason with this lunacy, trying to explain how the justice arguments are simply retarded, since unlike most of the rest of Africa, the South African Republic was not colonized, but rather settled, and the blacks, particularly the Bantu people groups, have immigrated into the place, drawn by the economic opportunities. None of that matters. Because you're not facing reasonable people here. You are facing a bunch of racist communists. Nothing more, nothing less. And you don't reason with these people. You revolt against such people and hang them for crimes against humanity. That is the appropriate treatment for such people. And the reason I insist with the Soviet Union parallels is because the vast majority of the leadership of the South African left was, in fact, schooled in the Soviet Union, including and especially Nelson Mandela, who was nothing more than a communist criminal who should have never been allowed to get out from jail and who, quite frankly, should have become a good communist back in the 1990s and not in December 2013. Now, in response to this particular new crisis, I've seen individuals saying that Europe should take up the white refugees from South Africa. Well, only the UK and the Netherlands both rejected them, so tough luck. I and Miles Chong, for instance, was suggesting that maybe Eastern Europe should pick up the slack. Well, I'm not into the racial solidarity camp, so I will stay as far away as possible from any such ideas. What has Eastern Europe done wrong to now have to take in these people? A much superior policy, in my opinion, would be to arm the whites and fight this government. And I'm not even joking. Communism needs to be met with violence, because violence is the only language communists understand and submit to. Any communist, no matter the race, color or creed, as Americans say, is still a communist and should be treated as such. Running away from the problem will not solve anything. Crushing the problem will solve something. Also, let's not forget this is not just about white people here. There are also hundreds of thousands of Asians, especially Chinese and Indian, who will be affected also, and about one million black people will also be affected by this policy, because the land will be taken from everyone. What if all landowners unite and finance an uprising against the commies? Now here's a thought. Ultimately, this will end in a much worse than Zimbabwe type of situation, and unless the scenario I just mentioned is deployed, this will not stop. Of course, every country in the civilized world should also start imposing sanctions on South Africa regime, since this is obviously a rogue regime and should thus have no business in hanging around civilized countries who at least make some 
effort to guarantee and protect property rights. But this is unlikely to happen either, because the leadership in most of Europe is cucked to the core, so you won't see any global whining about the topic like we've seen in the 1990s. Too bad there was no social media back then, so I can't prove that I said at the time that things will get significantly worse, so I can't claim I told you so on that. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, don't count on Europe on this one. Eastern Europe will not give a shit, because why would we? And Western Europe already announced it doesn't care either. Heck, the flagship of European news, Reuters, describes this mon monstrosity as follows, quote, Vote in South Africa's parliament moves land reform closer. That's it, just, just a land reform like any other. Not to mention they get some details wrong right from the first paragraph, but that's standard for the Reuters, which hasn't been a serious venue for quite some time now. So yeah, don't count on Europe. Europe will not care. For now. Hopefully it will care enough when the famine comes and Europe will say no to any requirement for aid. And that's all I will say in public about this topic. Emphasis on in public. All right, moving on. Let's talk about governmental, uh, about environmental nonsense and governmental nonsense. Coming via the Telegraph, German court rules cities can ban diesel cars to combat air pollution. Longish article, so I'll read just a portion. Quote: Diesel cars should be banned from German cities within weeks to cut air pollution following a landmark court ruling on Tuesday. In a decision that is thought uh, could inspire similar moves across Europe, Germany's highest administrative court ruled that individual municipalities can ban older diesel cars from their streets in order to bring pollution levels down. The ruling sent shares in German uh, uh, car makers tumbling and caused widespread concern among diesel car owners that their vehicles could lose almost all their second-hand value if they're banned from city streets. Hamburg, Germany's second largest city, said it would impose a ban on some of its most polluted streets within a few weeks, and other major cities, including Düsseldorf and Stuttgart, the home of Mercedes and Porsche, are expecting to follow. Angela Merkel sought to calm public concerns over the ruling. It's about individual cities where more needs to be done, she said. It's not really about the whole country or all the car owners in Germany. Any diesel bans will be watched closely across Europe and could be copied by other countries as they seek to find ways to lower pollution levels. The UK and Germany are among uh, several countries facing the threat of legal action from the European Commission unless they do more to solve the problem. Tuesday's court uh, ruling was a victory for German Environmental Aid, an NGO which sued uh, uh, Stuttgart and Dusseldorf, two of Germany's most polluted cities, in order to force them to implement bans. This is a great day for clean air in Germany, Jürgen Resch, so, uh, the head of the NGO, said. What we're seeing here is a debacle for the government which sided with the car industry. Greenpeace also welcomed the decision. Every city can now defend its citizens' right to clean air, a spokesman said. But it was greeted with dismay by business groups. We continue to strongly oppose bans and call on local communities and cities to do everything they can to avoid them, the Central Association of German Crafts said in a statement. In a commuter country, we also have to think of those who have small budget, cannot afford the latest car model, and get to work by bicycle, uh, Julia Klöckner, named uh, as agricultural minister by Mrs. Merkel, a few days ago said. Under the ruling, cities where, where air pollution exceeds official limits uh, will be able to issue their own bans and on older diesel cars without authority from the central government. Certain businesses which rely on diesel vehicles will be granted an exemption, but the court ruled that diesel owners whose vehicles were banned were not entitled to compensation. Close quote. Now this is typical European socialist ballooning. Create a problem, wait for it to fester, and then come up with an even bigger government quote-unquote solution to the problem you yourself created in the first place. That is the template. In this particular case, we're not even talking about a problem, but rather a perceived problem by a minuscule vocal minority who re really represent exactly nobody. I've been to Hamburg. Um, that's not a polluted, polluted city. Rome is a polluted city. Beijing is a polluted city. Turin or Torino is a polluted city. Hamburg? Not even close. Now that's one aspect. Second aspect. The reason Europe, and particularly Western Europe, has so many diesel cars is because the governments decided to subsidize diesel. 
Now, of course, the eco-Marxists claim that uh, diesel is still being subsidized today, which is a half-truth at best, since they, uh, they call uh, not stealing money from the industry as a subsidy. Because they are insane. The belief that a smaller tax is a subsidy is like uh, saying railway users are being subsidized by the airlines because they don't pay landing fees at the airport. It's just insane all around. Nevertheless, the idea of banning diesel cars is like virtually all other eco-Marxist and or social democratic policies, a measure that will fuck up the poor the most. Because it's the poor in Germany who still use very old diesel cars. And they use them because they can't afford a newer car. And banning it without compensation is basically a smaller scale of what the South African government is doing to land. Forced expropriation without compensation. In other words, institutionalized theft. Also, has anyone uh, noticed that the highest degrees of pollution occur in the highest regulated markets? For instance, India cut most of it, the fuel subsidies back in 2012 and in 2016 the newly elected right-wing cabinet cut the remaining ones. The result? The degree of pollution in India overall went down. Sure, India overall still pollutes a lot, but that's because India as a country still needs to grow. It's easy for Germany and for American leftists to talk about environmental friendly technologies and whatnot, that's all fine and dandy, but they're doing it all while Germany's necessity to pollute is largely in the past. But Germany's past is India's present day. And even in Germany this won't go, go down well, just like the closure of nuclear plants didn't go down well either. At one moment there were several tens of thousands of Germans who were quite literally homeless because of the electricity bill. Now, most of that has changed for the better, but not thanks to the government, but thanks to the global energy market, including and especially thanks to the United States fracking industry, which lowered the prices of energy for almost everyone on the planet. Now, that is helping the poor. But you wouldn't know that if you're only reading the leftist press, which is really all of the press, since the eco-Marxist fairy tale is still prevalent, so in effect, the entirety of the press is not just leftist, but far leftist on this topic. Also, in the case of Germany, it also doesn't help the public transport is so bloody expensive. And to make things worse, if you book in advance, it's actually more expensive than if you book in the same day by train. Seriously, how does that make any sense? The point I'm trying to make here is that all of these so-called NGOs and the Marxist politicians who are helping them don't give two hoots about the environment and never have. And on a more general point, this idea that you can have it all is a rather new invention. And it's an invention that needs to be thrown back into the garbage disposal from where it was recycled. Yes, there are trade-offs to civilization. You cannot have indoor plumbing, 20 or 21st century transportation and liberty all without polluting in some way, shape or form. And the eco-Marxist policies don't address any of this because they can't address it. All they can do is chip away some more from the liberty of the populace and that's pretty much it. Because the reduction in pollution is mostly imaginary. Since their alternative solutions actually pollute more <laughs> most of the time. Although it is true that they don't pollute in the city, just in uh, some mines in the Congo or some toxic factory in China. Good job, lefties! <sighs> Alright, one more also from the Euro-Socialist La La Land. EU says stands ready to regulate cryptocurrencies, titles Kitco.com, which is a portal for investors in various things, especially gold and silver. So, a uh, short article, quote, The European Union stands ready to regulate cryptocurrencies if risks from the sector are not tackled at the global level, the bloc's financial services chief said on Monday. A global investment craze over Bitcoin and other virtual currencies in the last year has seen wild durations in their valuations, making fortunes for some investors while others have lost heavily. This is a global phenomenon and it's important there is an international follow-up at a global level, Valdis Dombrovskis told reporters. 
We do not exclude the possibility to move ahead by regulating cryptocurrencies at the EU level if we see, for example, risks emerging but no international response emerging. Dombrovskis uh, was speaking after hosting a roundtable attended by the European Central Bank, industry bodies and the Financial Stability Board, which writes and coordinates regulation for the group of 20 economies. G20 finance ministers and central bankers meet in Buenos Aires in March with cryptocurrencies set to be on the agenda. The EU EU will decide how to address the issue later this year or early in 2019, the Financial Services Commissioner said. Germany and France said this month that while new opportunities arose from cryptocurrencies, they could also pose substantial risks for investors and be vulnerable to financial crime without safeguards. But given they represent just a tiny part of the financial system, so far there appears to be no strong consensus among the G20 countries to regulate them closely. Policymakers worry about losing jobs and growth to other regions if they crack down hard on innovation in the sector, especially stemming from the blockchain technology that underpins cryptocurrencies, which Dombrovsky said holds strong promise. Markus Ferber, a centre-right member of the European Parliament, said a quick EU regulatory response was needed rather than waiting years for international rules to trickle through. In order to make sure that retail investors do not fall prey to market manipulation and fraud, virtual currencies should be regulated as other financial instruments, Faber said in a statement. First of all, just a quick question. Who in Europe voted for Valdis Dombrovskis? The answer is, of course, nobody. Not even his fellow countrymen in Latvia like him that much, but Mr. Dombrovsky is one of those people made for EU politics. This is a man who has never faced the electorate since he was appointed Prime Minister without being elected and resigned before having to stand for re-election. Before being Prime Minister, he was also Minister of Finance, with his prime achievement being to surrender his country's economy to the unelected, unaccountable bureaucracy in Brussels. He is also vigorously opposed to Latvia's recent reforms, which turned the country's financial sector from a shithole into, by far, the most attractive system in the Eurozone. So this socialist kid, essentially, with a degree in electrical engineering, tells us about how currencies should be regulated? Really? Mr. Commissioner, with all due bloody respect, please go suck a bag of dicks. Respectfully, of course. Now, let's cut to the chase. There is no such thing as regulating cryptocurrencies at the EU level. It's not just not going to work. Unless the European Union intends to shut down the internet and perhaps the power grid as well, oh wait, the EU can't do that either, since the continent is not even on the same standard. Mr. Dombrovsky's own homeland is still tied to Soviet-era electricity distribution systems, which are entirely different than the rest of Europe. Funny how they found time over there to get into the next USSR, but didn't find the money or the time to fix something more obvious. But in any event, the idea that the EU can regulate cryptocurrencies is laughable at best and further evidence of how detached from reality the Eurocrats actually are at worst. It's also funny for Marcus Ferber to talk about pr protecting retail investors from market manipulation and fraud but he means, what he means is basically only we are allowed to do that. Because the EU has zero moral legitimacy on this issue. Not after the uh, multiple schemes of money printing that ut utterly wrecked Greece and Portugal in particular, with Portuguese people now emigrating to Angola to find jobs, and not after the large-scale theft that the EU orchestrated in Cyprus. I'm sorry, but you do not get a word on this topic with that track record. Also, while we're, we're on the topic of fraud, perhaps the EU should at least try to get its accounts fully signed off? Maybe? I mean, it's already been some time now, about 25 years or so, since this happened the last time. The point here is that the European Union doesn't have the actual power nor the moral integrity to be taken seriously by essentially anyone if it were to try to regulate cryptocurrencies, which is why it will never happen. This whole posturing, oh, we'll do it by the end of this year or early nine, uh, 2019, yeah, yeah, that's for idiots. First of all, there is a EU election next year. 
Who in his right mind would get into this mess just before the elections? Also again, except by cutting off the internet, there is no way for the EU to regulate this. Unlike the United States, the EU is much more fragmented and largely cash-based. So the smaller transactions will continue to be in cash, in this case cash for Bitcoin or other uh, cryptocurrency, while the big transactions will continue to be, to be run through accounts in Panama or Northern Cyprus, which is again quite outside the European Union's jurisdiction. If I know this, then surely someone in Brussels knows this too. If Dombrovskis doesn't know it, then he's even more stupid than I assumed he was. And believe me, I assumed the worst out of every single member of any European Commission. If he does know this, then he's simply engaging in day-to-day -day EU business, which is lying and hoping enough fools actually believe it. Whatever the case may be, Mr. Dombrovskis is full of it. All right, I think that's enough for now. Still a lot of insanity in the queue, so I'll get uh, ready to record episode 20 as well in this batch, since I'll soon travel again and thus another week without me creating new stuff will pass, so might as well fill in as much of it as possible. <laughs> Alright, so with all of that being said, thank you all for watching, thank you for your continuous and generous support, and um, I'll see you all very soon on Freedom Alternative.